please remain standing for the invocation. God of many names, of many times and places, be present with us this morning as we mark a new chapter in the history of Blackburn College. Hear our hopes and dreams and temper them with our own responsibility and commitment. Draw our gaze toward all that lies ahead, lest we lose ourselves and you in the pomp and circumstance. Guide our thoughts and our steps to be more conscious of our purpose, to learn, to work, to earn, together, one with another. Amen. You may be seated. A housekeeping moment. Please turn off your cell phones. Uh, we would not like to have the ceremony interrupted by someone's fancy beep. Um, and the exits are clearly marked and there are ushers at the exits to uh, show you to restrooms. And uh, also at the end of the ceremony, we really hope that each of you will visit the wonderful Victor Wang art uh, exhibit to your left as you exit the auditorium. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the uh, Transition Committee. And I would like for the Transition Committee to please stand and be recognized for their hard work. Please stand. At this time, I'd like to introduce the platform party. Uh, Roy Graham, College Marshal. Jacob Mag, Student Senate President. Deanna Demusio, Mayor of Carlinville and also a board trustee. Angela Duffy, President of the Alumni Board. Rachel Rumpel Comerford, who we are pleased to have as a new member of the Blackburn family. Rachel was raised in the area, central Illinois, and is pleased to be back with her family who live in this area. John Cumberford, president, whom you will hear more from later. Gary Lure, executive director at my far left of the, of the Presbyterian Colleges and Universities. Dr. Jeff Aper, provost of the college. Ed Young, chair of the board of trustees. Mem Pride, president emeritus of Blackburn College and Erica Brown, college chaplain. Dr. Aper. It's my honor to introduce those representing other universities and colleges who are here with us today. It's traditional that the order of march for these individuals is set in the order of the age of the institution. And so I begin with uh, representing McKendree University in Lebanon, Illinois, Dr. Joseph Siffel, Dean of the Graduate School. Representing Illinois College in Jacksonville, Illinois, Mr. Robert Chipman, Vice Chair of the Board of Trustees. Representing the University of Missouri, Columbia, Missouri, Dr. David Sundberg, Professor Emeritus. Representing Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri, Dr. Clifford Kane, Herod C.S. Lewis Professor of Religious Studies. Also representing Westminster College in Fulton, Missouri, Dr. William Sheehan, Vice President for Institutional Advancement. Representing Monmouth College in Monmouth, Illinois, Ms. Christine Johnston, Registrar. Representing Wilson College in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, Ms. Kizian Rassi Easton, alumna. Representing Greenville College in Greenville, Illinois, Dr. Ivan Philby, president. Representing Warren Wilson College in Asheville, North Carolina, Mr. Joseph Eck, alumnus. And representing Western Illinois University in Macomb, Illinois, Mr. Matthew Bierman, Director of the Budget Office. Representing the University of Missouri at Kansas City, in Kansas City, Missouri, Dr. Sue Sunberg, Professor Emerita. Sincere thanks to each of you for joining us on this important occasion in the history of Blackburn College. Thanks.
Please rise for the singing of the hymn which is printed in your program and then remain standing for the scripture. may be seated. A reading from the ninth chapter of the Gospel according to John. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might manifest in him. We must work the works of him who sent me, while it is day. Night comes when no one can work. As long as I am the world, I am the light of the world. As he, as he said this, he spat on the ground and made clay of the spittle and anointed the man's eyes with the clay, saying to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. So he went and he washed and he came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar said, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but it is like him. He said, I am the man. They said to him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and said to me, go wash in the pool of Siloam and wash my eyes. So I went and I washed and I received my gift. The word of the Lord.
Thank you, choir, for that beautiful number. Now we'll have Jacob Maggs uh, give a few words from the students. Good morning, and, wel and welcome again to Blackburn College. My name, as Dr. Laux stated, is Jacob Mag. I'm a junior here at Blackburn, and am student senate president. At this time, I would like for our student representatives to stand, as well as any students out in the audience, and then, as well, and then I would like the students in the choir to stand as well, please. The campus community has been anticipating our presidential transition for about the past year or so. And the students, just like the rest of our community, have been a little concerned about how smoothly this transition would happen. This is partly because if there's one word that sparks uneasiness above many others, it's change. And when it comes to accepting change, I can admit that I'm one of the worst. I believe a quote from one of my favorite authors, Jody Picot, addresses change best by stating that change isn't always for the worst. The shell that forms around a piece of sand looks to some people like an irritation and to others like a pearl. I think we have found a pearl with Dr. Cumberford and his family. Students have thoroughly enjoyed meeting him with his warm smile, welcoming disposition, and his character, I am John, greeting. He, he won't let us call him Dr. Cumberford. What can I say? He can, he can truly speak with anyone. I believe that I can speak on behalf of the student body by saying we are happy to have you here. And we hope you are at Blackburn College for decades to come. Thank you. Good morning. I ask that members of the faculty and staff, wherever they be in this auditorium, please stand at this time. Our college, as has been iterated more than once, stands on the threshold of a new era. It's our wish that in the years that lie before us, the college's long-standing educational mission and the traditions and values that form the heart of the college will not only endure, but be strengthened. Inspired by President John Comerford's ideas for ensuring the health and the future of our college, members of the faculty and staff are working with deliberate speed to implement them. We believe Blackburn College will continue to prosper within the unique sphere of the academic universe in which the college has existed since 1913 the date in which the unique work program came to life, and the moment when it became possible for all members of the college community to contribute their knowledge, their labor, and their spirit to a greater cause, to serve the needs of humanity and the greater world in which we live. Thank you. Good morning and welcome. It is my honor on behalf of the city of Carlinville to welcome John, Rachel, Garrett, Reagan, and Grant to our community. It has been my privilege to get to know them personally. You have come to Carlinville at a great time. In the past year, momentum has been building, hope is being renewed, great ideas are being discussed, and countless opportunities are, lie before us. Blackburn College is in the same position. We welcome your visionary leadership to guide our college into a future filled with opportunities and endless possibilities. On behalf of the City of Carlinville, our Chamber, and all of our organizations, we look forward to creating strategic partnerships that enhance both Blackburn, Carlinville, and our community. On a personal note, I want to thank Garrett. Where's Garrett? Hi, Garrett. Good morning. I want to thank Garrett 
for assuring your parents that it would be okay to leave your friends behind because Carlinville has an Amtrak station. <laughs> you see, Garrett, you see, Garrett has the love of trains that he inherited from his grandfather. And where's his grandfather at? Okay, I think, yeah, you're the guy that kind of instilled some of that in him, okay? So Garrett has been to City Hall, as well as John, and he has been a part of all of the renovation that is happening here in Carlinville when it comes to our, our train and our high-speed rail. And I'm sure that Garrett will still be, uh, is going to be a major part as, in the coming years as we continue on our renovation. So thank you, John and Rachel, for sharing Garrett with us. And thank you all, welcome to Carlinville. Good morning. My name is Angela Duffy. I'm the class of 1995 and the current alumni board president. On behalf of the entire alumni board, it is my great privilege to be with you as we celebrate the inauguration of Dr. John Comerford as the 16th president of Blackburn College. Around here, it's not too often we get to celebrate an inauguration, with the last one I believe being in 1991, or as I will always remember it, freshman year. The alumni, the alumni board has had the opportunity to meet with John and discuss his vision for Blackburn's future. It took only a few minutes of meeting with him to know that he shares our deep commitment to the thing that makes Blackburn truly unique, our work program. He understands the value of a liberal arts education and has many wonderful ideas on how to grow this beloved institution of ours. There does not seem to be much of a learning curve with John either. He has immediately picked up on Blackburn's culture its many strengths and its challenges too. That was evident when we first spoke with him and he'd only been on the job for about six weeks. For many alums, they cannot think of a president other than Mim Pride. Um, Mim may be small in physical stature, but left rather large shoes to fill. On behalf of the alumni board and the alumni across the country, I would like to reassure you that John is the right choice for the position. The, um, committee that selected him and the Board of Trustees did a thorough search and a wonderful job with his selection. He will do an excellent job filling those rather large shoes. President Comerford, the Alumni Board is excited to partner with you as we seek to increase the depth and involvement and support that Blackburn alumni can provide. We look forward to watching and participating in the implementation of your vision, a vision we know is the next exciting chapter in Blackburn's long history. We would also like to extend our warmest welcome to the entire Comerford family. We are so glad that you are here and welcome to our Blackburn family. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Ed Young. I'm chairman of the Board of Trustees and a Blackburn graduate 1962. This is truly an historic day for Blackburn, as it is for John and his family, his parents, his extended family and friends across the country. Some of us here present today met John almost exactly a year ago, October 29th to be exact. By the end of last November, John and the board agreed that he would become our 16th president and our first in over 22 years. John started on July the 1st, four months ago, just four short months ago. It would be an understatement to say that he hit the ground running. In just four months, he's traveled across the country, meeting with trustees and key alumni. He's held many meetings on campus and included all constituencies. In this very short period, he's gained an in-depth understanding of the challenges facing Blackburn and of the many strengths that we have. He's beginning to use those strengths to meet those challenges. The board is confident that John and his team will succeed. Furthermore, he understands the challenges facing higher education in this country and how to position Blackburn in that marketplace. Will the trustees please stand? John, as chairman of the board, 
I congratulate you on behalf of all trustees, and I pledge that we will use our time, talent, and treasure to assure your success. Congratulations. Good morning. My name is Gary Luer. I'm executive director of the Association of Presbyterian Colleges and Universities, which is proud to have Blackburn College as one of its members. And on behalf of the Presbyterian Church USA, I bring greetings and congratulate Dr. Comerford on his appointment at the, as the 16th president of Blackburn College. I congratulate as well the Board of Trustees for having selected someone of President Comerford's caliber to lead this outstanding institution at an important stage in its history. When Jesus was asked what is the greatest commandment, he replied that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. In the Presbyterian Church, higher education is the oldest form of mission beyond the local congregation. Blackburn College is one of more than 60 colleges and universities that have an historic relationship with the Presbyterian Church, having been founded in 1837 by the Reverend Gideon Blackburn, a Presbyterian evangelist. What began as the Blackburn Theological Seminary is today a college that welcomes students of every religious tradition, providing an educational experience built on such values as truth, service, community, and working for the common good. Dr. Comerford, you are now part of this rich heritage. The Apostle Paul in his letter to the Romans said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God. I encourage you to make that a guiding principle as you lead this fine institution. Education must be transforming for those whom you send forth from this place if they are to become leaders in the world that lies before us, a world that faces a myriad of challenges and sometimes struggles to find its moral compass. As students acquire the knowledge and skills they will need for a world that is ever-changing, make certain that they also gain the spiritual and moral values that they will need to bring about positive change. Teach them to respect the diversity that surrounds them and help them understand that their highest calling is serving others. God bless you as you begin to write the next chapter in the history of Blackburn College. At this time, I invite Matthew Bierman of Western Illinois University to come forward to make a special presentation. I'm honored to represent Western Illinois University and bring greetings on behalf of our president, Dr. Jack Thomas, the alma mater. Western Illinois University is the alma mater of your 16th president, Dr. John Comerford. And upon our president's request, I will read you his remarks. Dear Dr. Comerford and the Blackburn College community, it gives me great pleasure to recognize the distinguished alumnus of Western Illinois University, John Comerford. Your career and achievements exemplify not only your work, but the quality of our graduates at Western. Your achievement today and your professional success illustrate the core values of both Western Illinois University and Blackburn College. We honor your commitment to higher education, which is a primary example of your leadership in educating and providing access and making college affordable to a broad range of citizens. For your life, your example as a role model, your leadership, and your many achievements, we honor you today and your presidency at Blackburn College by presenting you this plaque. I will now read what the plaque says. I present Dr. John Comerford this commemorative medal in recognition as a dynamic and visionary leader, model citizen and true advocate for higher education, for the insight and promise and talent he embodies as the 16th president of Blackburn College. In sincere appreciation for his steadfast and ongoing commitment to higher education, civic and community engagement, for exemplary leadership rendered 
and his generosity and proud recognition of his growing devotion to the betterment of his alma mater. Western Illinois University congratulates John Comerford on his inauguration as the president and is proud to present this commemorative medal on this second day of November in the year 2013 at Blackburn College in Carlinville, Illinois. In, fr from the 11th president of Western Illinois University, Dr. Jack Thomas and all of its alumni, to the 16th president of Blackburn College, Dr. John Comerford, a proud graduate of Western Illinois University, we say congratulations. Good morning. <clears throat> John, as you accept the responsibilities of the 16th president of Blackburn College, you acknowledge the importance of the, of the traditions of this 175-year-old institution and the challenges of keeping faith with those traditions while assuring that those traditions find meaningful expression in the current environment. According to the information provided to incoming students, traditions are statements of established community relationships and values, which the old hands living here transmit to newcomers. Families, communities, and nations have traditions that guide their activities, and so it is with Blackburn. Blackburn College was founded on and seeks to serve key values that help to define the college and keep it focused while new lifeblood, students, faculty and staff, and presidents arrive and depart. All college ceremonies are opportunities, opportunities to celebrate those traditions and the symbols that represent them, and none more so than the inaugurating of a new president. Among the traditions that I believe will be important in your presidency, the college motto, Cristo et humanitate, for Christ and all humanity, reminds us of our roots in the Reformed tradition, Presbyterian Church USA, as, as Gary talked to us a minute ago, which values the intellect and the spirit, as well as the importance of each individual's and his or her unique spiritual journey. Gideon Blackburn's Bible, which is displayed at all official ceremonies, is a symbol of that tradition. And the president's robe, which is scarlet, a color associated with the study of religion, reminds us that Blackburn historically was founded as a theological seminary. The banner, which has as its central feature the seal, declares our unity and our official character and name, which is actually Blackburn University. As you know, we use Blackburn College. Blackburn is a not-for-profit corporation founded in 1837 and chartered in 1857 by the people of the state of Illinois. At the top of the banner are seven squares representing the liberal arts. At the bottom, the three brand, bands represent the fundamental virtues, faith, hope, and charity. The mace, is the symbol of our commitment to liberty through responsible scholarship, teaching, and learning. In addition, the mace represents the carefully defined authority of the president of the college and honors the service of the presidents, acting presidents, and principals who preceded you. The baton, which is not on the stage this morning, is a symbol of the office of the student marshal who is a member of the senior class elected by the faculty after consideration of character, intellectual achievement, and leadership. The role of student marshal is indicative of the importance of students in the leadership of the college and is expressed through the marshal's role as a spokesperson for students, as a leader at the official ceremonies of the college, including the honors banquet, commencement, and baccalaureate, and through that student service on very important governing committees of the college. The tradition of work and service learning and leadership are evidenced in the unique 
program that we call the Work Program, which has celebrated its 100th year this year. The most significant symbols of that tradition are, the, are to be found in the student built and maintained buildings in which we learn, work, and live. No doubt, John, you will add your own traditions to these, and it will be exciting to see what those are. I'd like for you and Ed to come and join me over here. I'm gonna <clears throat> the symbol of your responsibilities as president is the collar of the office. The collar links are silver and oblongs which are inscribed with the names of your predecessors. The pendant is an image of the college seal. The collar is as unique as the institution it represents. Consistent with Blackburn's tradition, the collar was designed and created by three members of the faculty who among them have given over a hundred years of service to Blackburn College and two of whom are here today. Roy Graham and Mitch Clark are both with us today and the third person was John Forbes who is known and remembered and by many generations Blackburn students. The significant weight of the collar is a reminder that the responsibilities of the presidency are not to be taken lightly. Your 15 predecessors brought their unique personalities, skills, and talents to the challenges of leadership. Each experienced moments of success and moments of disappointment. Taken together, their efforts have resulted in 175 years of remarkable service that has transformed the lives of thousands of young people. Their su success, the success of these leaders, is not so much a personal achievement. You and I have talked about that. As evidence of the ability to lead the trustees, faculty, staff, students, alumni, and all of our friends in building a learning community based on a shared vision. In that process, it is important to remember that each person needs to understand what their unique role can be. That challenge is now yours, John. Empowered by the Board of Trustees in this community, Chairman Young and I have the responsibility, the delightful responsibility of passing to you this presidential collar, which officially installs you as the 16th president of Blackburn College. May God bless you and may God bless Blackburn. Ladies and gentlemen, the 16th president of Blackburn College. rise once again for the blessing. <laughs> Good and gracious God, we ask your blessing upon Blackburn College and President John Comerford. May he lead with clarity, with confidence, ever guided by your grace, led by your love. May he honor and respect the traditions of Blackburn College all the while challenging us to move ever forward, recognizing the great privilege we all know to be present in the lives of our students, the very reason we do all that we do. May he embrace this community and all that it represents, possibility, potential, reason, responsibility, cooperation, character. May he be embraced welcomed warmly into the warp and weave of who we are and who we hope to be. May he value the pursuit of knowledge, the inspiration of creativity, the integrity of work well done. May he practice compassion, humility, forgiveness, understanding 
with his colleagues and with himself. May he be blessed with a sense of humor, which enables him to keep things in perspective when all does not go as smoothly as planned. May he seek balance in his life, respecting the many demands upon his time, acknowledging he is not only a president, but first and foremost, a husband, a father, a son, a brother, a friend. Finally, grant your wise discernment in times of trial, and may your abiding peace be ever present. In your name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Wow, Erica, that was quite a list, no pressure. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you all very much. Obviously, I'm always eager to get going around here. Uh, I've been actually sitting up here and, and thinking that this is probably as close as I'll ever get to attending my own funeral. <laughs> um, I really appreciate all the kind words. I'm not sure I'm worthy of any of them, uh, but it's, it's, it's really an honor to be here and I, I do appreciate it. Despite the fancy robe and the new jewelry, we need to remind ourselves that today is not about me, including how today came together. We had a really outstanding transition committee recognized before, led so ably by Hazel Laux that made all this happen. Hazel just retired a few months ago, but I think thanks to these duties, she's yet to feel retired. Hazel, you're done in 20 minutes. I, I can't even begin to enumerate. I started at one point to make a list of all the people I needed to thank, and I was going to end up thanking the entire campus. So we'll have to suffice to say that I went to one of the planning meetings to put all this together. Half the campus was present. I quickly figured out I could be of no use in that room, and so left. Um, but you have to remember that an inauguration is not an everyday occurrence at a college. In fact, at Blackburn, it's an every 22 years occurrence. <laughs> And so all this has come together on top of everyone's regular duties. And it has taken a lot of work and a lot of time, and it's come together beautifully. And I'm honored and humbled at everyone that made this happen, so thank you. I'm also hum humbled to have so many people here tonight uh, among uh, Rachel and I's friends and family. Uh, of course, my wife Rachel, I would like to recognize my three kids, Garrett, Reagan, and Grant, I think was just escorted from the room. <laughs> didn't want to hear me talk. He was good until me, which is a <laughs> great sign. Uh, my parents, my brother and sister, my in-laws, friends and mentors from undergraduate and graduate school, friends and colleagues. I, 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 I once said you only had a gathering like this at your wedding and your funeral. Now I have to add presidential inauguration to the list of times that you get such a group like this together, many of whom have traveled from a long distance, and it means so much that you came here for this. Thank you. Finally, I, I have to especially recognize the last two folks that were up here, Mim Pride and Ed Young. Ed Young has been serving as our board chair for nearly 10 years. As his wife Lillian would surely tell you, that's a full-time job, uh, stewarding an institution like this, and Ed has done it magnificently. I still remember my first interaction with Ed last October, over a year ago, where he was calling all the semi-finalists for the position and, and sort of laying out the process and here's what's going to happen next. And on his list of things he needed to cover was clearly that Blackburn is in a relatively small town surrounded by cornfields for an hour in every direction. He needed to make sure the candidates understood that. I, I, I remember during that conversation, I think I interrupted it and I said, yeah, I think I, I know where Carlinville is. I'm from central Illinois. And don't you guys have a hotel there with like a paddle boat in the backyard and a puddle? And Ed got so excited that I knew <laughs> where it was. It was clear that I was maybe the first candidate that knew where, where it was. And so I think from that moment, he became comfortable with me. And I've always been very comfortable with him as a partner at my side through this. And we really appreciate, Ed, all of your work uh, for Blackburn. It wouldn't be the same place without you. Ed represents an entire board of trustees, many of whom are down here in front of me, um, that are really dedicated volunteer servant leaders for this institution. Uh, it's the hardest job you'll ever have to pay to have. And we really appreciate all of your work, and we have an outstanding board. Finally, Mim, I'm so happy that you were able to come back for this. It wouldn't have been the same without you. I count myself as lucky every day that good things happen at Blackburn College because of the work that happened long before I got here. 
And Mim set this up, set me up, and set all of us up for great success. There, on day one, I didn't walk into anything on fire. There was no faculty insurrection, a micromanaging board, or some massive budget deficit, at least that I've discovered so far. <laughs> And that is a testament to her stewardship over 22 years in this role. That is an inspiration to me every day that she did so well for so long for institutions she loves. And as I know, an inspiration to all of our faculty, staff, and students. And today wouldn't have been the same without you, ma'am. Thank you. One of the things we talk a lot about at Blackburn is the idea of vocation. We're not just here to prepare students. That is not a good sign. Wow. Maybe I should just sit down now. Oh well, things happen. There's good days and bad days like Mim said. <laughs> anyway, one of the things we talk a lot about here is the idea of vocation. We don't just prepare students for jobs or careers. We prepare them to find a calling for their life, a purpose for their life, a place in this world where they know they can have the satisfaction every day of knowing they're making some difference in this world. That's what we do here. And I must say, I feel that sense of vocation. I feel that sense of calling myself at Blackburn College. I am absolutely sure that every college president in the country would say and truly believe that their institution is absolutely unique, special, and worthy of national recognitions for all the great things that it is. And I, I think they're, they're right in their own ways. I've come to believe, however, that Blackburn College has some attributes and qualities that do make it truly unique on the national stage and give us a role in the future of American higher education that is not similar to other institutions. When I think about what makes Blackburn distinct, the first thing I think about is our commitment to undergraduate liberal arts education. I know we're not alone. There are lots of great liberal arts colleges out there, all of them doing fantastic work. But the truth is, there's a dwindling number of them that have stayed true to their core. There's a lot of temptations to specialize. There's huge financial incentives to opening up master's programs and professional programs on campus, online, or in storefronts that most colleges have been unable to resist. Blackburn College has stayed true to its core, despite the fact that there are national calls from parents, from businesses, and from the government itself saying, what we need you to do is prepare students for jobs. Stop teaching them Play-Doh. Teach them programming or something they can use goes their refrain. But we know at Blackburn College that if we, that's all we do, we lose something critically important. Liberal arts in modern times is a uniquely American idea. And there's a reason for that. At the heart of what we do at Blackburn College and other liberal arts colleges is we're teaching active citizenship and participative democracy. These are more than theories in a textbook here. A liberally educated citizenry is an absolute prerequisite to the success of our democracy. Thomas Jefferson understood this over 200 years ago when he said, if a nation expects to be ignorant and free, it expects what never was and never can be. I would suggest that liberal arts education actually creates freedom. A person cannot truly be free if they cannot think independently about the world around them. If you take what's said on TV or in a book and do not question it and think critically about it and simply accept it as truth, you're not free. If you are unable to see multiple cultures and multiple perspectives and form your own understanding of the world, you're not free. At the end of the day, a liberal arts education is teaching values. And we ought not be shy about using that word. We teach the values of the pursuit of truth, reason, social justice, appreciation of difference, the value of beauty, kindness, charity, and leadership. Our graduates must go on to be contributing members of our society for our nation to continue to prosper. It's like the gospel reading we heard today, the blind man sees. 
technical training of students may impart a set of skills that they need on certain jobs, but only a liberal education opens their eyes to the world around them. Let me say that liberal arts colleges like Blackburn don't have the market cornered on this. The truth is, despite my competitive spirit sometimes and always wanting Blackburn to win at everything, we need other institutions to be successful. We need other liberal arts colleges, we need research universities, we need public universities, we need community colleges to create the citizens we need for our society. We can't do this alone. It's my hope that those institutions do their educational work without falling prey to the lure of over-specialization. But there are also those that say this model of higher education is dying on the vine. So goes the thought that this is terribly inefficient. Surely we can think of a better way to do this, a more efficient way to do this, than a residential campus with small classes, full-time tenured faculty that care about their students and staff that are ded dedicated to their success. Surely it must be more efficient to pack hundreds of students into an online class taught by an adjunct or a teaching assistant. Surely that must be better and would help us get more educated Americans. There was another time where something very similar was said about technology. There was a time where suddenly the world opened up and knowledge became accessible to the common person. Suddenly, professors and colleges and teachers didn't have a monopoly on education anymore. And surely then, went the refrain then, they would become unnecessary. People could access information on their own, and therefore all of these institutions we've built and learned professions would be unnecessary. The year was 1450 and the Gutenberg printing press had just made books widely available for the first time. And yet somehow, we're still here. We're still relevant and we're still necessary to the educational enterprise. I would suggest the same is the case today. Technology gives us wonderful new tools in education, but at the end of the day, a website, a chat room, or a massive open online course are no different than a book. They're nice, interesting, good new ways to deliver content. But we understand at Blackburn and other liberal arts colleges that the transformational experience of education happens in relationships. It's having a faculty member who knows your name and knows how to challenge you as an individual. It's having staff members dedicated to your success. It's being part of a community of students that work together and form relationships. That's the magic that happens that you cannot replicate through technology. I believe this distinctive part of Blackburn will remain critically important because people will still demand it. Families and students continue to demand residential undergraduate education for a reason. They know it's not the same as the alternatives. And so we'll continue to make that a cornerstone of who we are. Second among our distinct features, features is our work program, of course. For those of you new to campus, you may realize we're a work college, and that means that all of our residential students are required to work 10 hours a week contributing to our community. I'm reminded every day that our students actually run the place. I'm convinced that if I didn't show up for work, it would be several weeks before anyone even noticed, <laughs> and much longer than that before there would be any ill effect. <laughs> but if our students decided to go on strike and didn't show up to work tomorrow to maintain our buildings, prepare our food, even teach our classes as teaching assistants here, the place would grind to a halt in a matter of hours. Our students are the most important part of our team here, and we must recognize that. You all may also know that the work program makes Blackburn affordable. We remain the most affordable independent institution in the state, more affordable even than most of the public institutions in the state. And that's thanks in large part to the work program. In fact, Dr. Hudson, one of my predecessors, started it 100 years ago as the self-help plan. We help students help themselves. The work program also creates a campus culture that is difficult to describe to someone who hasn't been at Blackburn for some time. The idea is simple. We are all contributors, contributors here. There are no givers and takers here. There are only givers. Alumni come back to campus and say with great pride, I built that building. I laid that sidewalk. I ran that program. Our alums understand, unlike I think alums at any other college, this is really and truly their college, their campus.
Blackburn was literally and figuratively built by our students. Our students know that and, can, and it contributes to a sense of pride on campus and ownership rarely seen other places. There is no four-year parent-subsidized vacation at Black, Blackburn College. <laughs> All of our students get up every day knowing they have to work and contribute to our community and that makes us meaningfully different in, term of the, in terms of the student experience. This actually leads me to what I think is the most important part of the work program. Remember those government officials and parents and business leaders that were complaining about higher education before and inefficiency? They actually have a point. They're just a little off on how they're making it. An bachelor's degree in the United States of America no longer holds the meaning it did a generation ago. We have cheapened the bachelor's degree in this country. It no longer means that a graduate is ready to contribute on day one. I, as you heard before, I've been able to travel around a lot and meet a lot of entrepreneurs and business leaders and people that have been very successful and people that hire college grads. And one of the things I hear all the time is I can't hire a college grad anymore that's ready to go on day one. They might have the technical skills. It's not that they didn't learn the technical skills they need for the job, that's fine. But they're missing some of the character traits they need for success. They don't know how to dress for work. They don't know how to show up on time for a meeting. They don't know how to facilitate a team. They don't know how to turn off their cell phone at the appropriate times. They are missing the soft skills that employers are demanding and rightly selling us as colleges we need to do a better job preparing students. Blackburn College is the answer to those concerns because of the work program. We have an excellent liberal arts education paired with a work program that gets them ready for career success. At the end of the day, what we teach in the work program is responsibility. We're not training future bricklayers and cooks and custodians. We're using those positions to teach them a set of values and responsibility that they will need when they go on to employment or graduate school. To that end, at Blackburn College, we've now developed learning outcomes for every job on campus. We should know what we're teaching, we should be able to track it, and we should be able to document it. So the student knows what they know and they can prove it to employers. We also are committed to developing a developmental program to the work program that makes sure that every student, by the time they're at senior year, they will be able to tell their employer and their first job interview that they led projects, they work independently, they supervise a team, and they got things done in a workplace environment. That's gonna put our graduates ahead, and at the end of the day, that's gonna mean a Blackburn bachelor's degree still has meaning. The last thing that I would point out that makes Blackburn meaningfully different and unique is our role in providing access to higher education. We're fortunate in the United States. We have the world's premier system of higher education. Students still flock from every corner of the globe to come get an American college degree. And today, 94% of American parents say they want their kids to go to college. I'm not really sure what's wrong with the other 6%, but it's clear that a college education is perceived as the primary path to financial and social security in our country. There is still value to what we do and people understand that. We have a great deal to be proud of, but we're slipping in higher education and it's no one's fault but our own. A generation ago, the United States was number one in the world in the proportion of 25 to 34 year olds that had a college education. Today, we're 12th. The demand remains there. 70% of high school graduates will go immediately on to some form of higher education. They want a college education. Our problem is they're landing at institutions where they are not likely to be successful. And in fact, of those that start higher education, only 25% will ever achieve a bachelor's degree. At the heart of the matter here is cost. In 1980, the average cost of attendance at a four-year college, put the publics and privates together and averaged them, was just under $3,500. You add inflation to that, and in today's dollars, that's about $8,700. The actual cost of an education today, on average, is $22,000. That's a 250% increase over a 30-year period in constant dollars. The reality is that families simply can't keep pace. Between 2001 and 2010, the cost of university education as a proportion of family income went from 23% to 
today just under 40%. Can you imagine getting a bill equivalent to 40% of your family's income? And that's what it costs to send your kid to school. Families are buckling under the pressure. 10 years ago, the average cost of attendance borne by the student's family was just under 40%. Today, it is 27% and falling. Families cannot keep pace and students are suffering. Naturally, this problem affects those from low-income families the worst. For kids in the top 20% of family incomes, most of them, 56% of them, will go on to get a bachelor's degree. For kids from the lowest 20% of family incomes, only 11% will ever get a bachelor's degree. Let me put 11% in context. 11% is the current approval rating for Congress. <laughs> it's terrible. We ought to be very worried about that. 35 years ago, the government introduced the Pell Program to help students from low-income families, but even that keep, can't keep pace with this problem. In 1980, 30 years ago, 60% of Pell-eligible students, of low-income students, were studying on four-year college campuses. Today, that number is 35%. 35% of low-income students find themselves on a four-year college campus. Even public colleges, thanks to state budget cuts largely beyond their control, have had to raise tuition so much that they put themselves out of reach. 20 years ago, 40% of the enrollment at public universities were Pell-eligible low-income students. Today, it's under 30% of our public institutions' enrollment are low-income students that are Pell-eligible. Low-income students are desperate for a college degree, but they're increasingly, increasingly left with few choices on how to get it. They can choose frequently between their community college, their local community college, or a for-profit institution operating online or in their local strip mall. Those programs may be fine for some students, but the reality is fewer of our students will get a degree if they don't start at a four-year college campus. Whole new business models have sprung up around this. The University of Phoenix, as you may know, is a for-profit, largely online institution. Last year alone, they collected a billion dollars from the federal Pell Grant program. The folks running the University of Phoenix are no fools. They figured something out. This is where the growth is in American higher education. In fact, from 1980 to today, from the beginning of the Pell program to today, 87% of the growth in enrollment in American colleges have been low-income Pell students. That's where the demand is. That's where the growth is. The university has figured it out, have we? What happens to our society if only those who have wealth are allowed access to our four-year institutions? What happens if socioeconomic status is the new segregation and the status you're born into is the status you're stuck with for life? What happens when those who are able and willing to get a college education are denied that opportunity and at the same time, the time there are no more decent wage jobs left for low-skilled workers? What happens to us as a country? I think this is a national crisis, and it's our fault. Our colleges have been too caught up in seeking prestige to be bothered to help these students. There is unfortunately no prestige in helping financially needy students. There's only prestige in fancy new buildings, programs, and ex increasing exclusivity. Our colleges are actually rewarded for closing the door on more Americans. Many of our most elite institutions, the ones with billions of dollars in their endowments, actually confess to being less likely to admit a high financial need student who's equally qualified to a wealthy student. Why? Because if you admit a high-need student and then they can't afford to attend, it messes up their yield rate and their U.S. news ranking. Talk about messed up priorities. They admit it. Our colleges have responded to a series of priorities, a series of incentives that have made this problem even worse. Let me return to our gospel reading. Two things happen that are relevant here. First, the apostles ask whether or not the man or his parents have sinned to cause his blindness. Jesus, of course, says it wasn't his fault or his parents' fault at all, but in American society today, the number one determinant to the future of, a, of an individual is the accident of their birth. Their parents' education, their parents' income level is the determining factor, above anything else, of their future. 
The second key thing that happens in the reading is that Jesus performs a miracle on a beggar in the street. His goal was to spread the word. And so surely it would have been better in spreading the word to perform a miracle on someone who was prominent, noteworthy, not someone that after the miracle was performed, people said, who is that guy? I don't even know who that is. The reality is that there is no prestige in helping the needy. They do not serve to build the reputation of a savior or of a college. But the lesson of the reading is you do it anyway. Blackburn has always been different in this regard. We've never shied from this mission, perhaps because of the work program, there is no compunction here about serving those who cannot afford alternatives. We believe we can be excellent and affordable and accessible. That is not a choice. We can do it all and be better as an institution and better as a society for it. In fact, I'm convinced this is such a problem that it's created a massive market of unserved or underserved students who are desperate to have a type of education we deliver. This national crisis is an opportunity for Blackburn College to make a difference. I'm therefore proud to announce today that Blackburn will become the only college in the state of Illinois and one of only a few in the nation to offer free tuition to our highest need students. We're calling it the Affordable Access Award or the AAA. Students whose families have the highest need, and we're going to define that as a zero dollar estimated family contribution when they complete the FAFSA, will be allowed to come here without paying tuition. They'll get Pell and MAP grants from the state. They'll work for some of that as part of our work program, and then the college will cover the rest. If they're from out of the county, they will have to pay room and board, but our room and board costs are 40% less than the state average, and we'll have a summer work program to help them afford that if that's a problem too. We made this decision several weeks ago, but we hadn't really announced it. And a few weeks ago, we had a family come visit campus. And uh, the daughter uh, and her parents were on campus, and they took the tour, and they met some of our faculty and staff, and they were impressed. And they ended the day in our office of admissions and talking with our director of admissions, and that's when the family made a confession. We don't really have any money for college. In fact, we've already completed the FAFSA and we have a zero estimated family contribution. We don't know how we're going to make this work. Our director of admissions told them about the AAA award and that they would qualify for free tuition at Blackburn College. And the mom cried because she knew in that moment for the first time that her daughter was going to get to go to college. Blackburn College is going to walk the walk and give students who need a chance a chance. We will do our part to educate those students, prepare and, and show that there's a new model in American higher education. One that's built around access and opportunity, not exclusion and excess. In other words, Blackburn College is not just another college. We're a place that has something to say about the direction of higher, uh, the direction of higher education and in fact the direction of our nation. We believe in an educated citizenry, developed in character through work and access to all that are able and willing. We've been doing this quietly for 175 years and it's a model that works. We are an active community of doers, students, faculty and staff trained to make a difference in the world. Blackburn College is now called upon to be a light in the darkness of American higher education and a leader in our collective future. I am humbled to play a very small role in that future and humbled to have been invited to join this cause. I hope that you'll all join us. Thank you very much.
you might guess, the choir is the students and community. And Liz has done this, and it's beautiful. Nice job. Before you go to your right to go to the reception, we hope you'll go to the left, and everybody knows why I'm saying this, because I got it backwards yesterday, uh, to see the wonderful uh, uh, Victor Ma Wang art exhibit. So we hope that you'll take advantage of both those things. We thank you very much for coming. Um, we're happy to welcome you, Dr. Comerford, as the new president. And we will ask that you please rise for the benediction and the benediction response. Respecting the vision of those who have gone before, celebrating the promise of all that is yet to be, let us go forth from this place with joyful hearts and gentle spirits. Let us go now in peace. Amen.